The next part I want to talk about is audio or auditory localization. How do we know where sounds are coming from? Well, let's compare it to the vision case. How do we know where um, the light is coming from? I guess I can just turn my head and look, right? So, I, I if someone's talking to me, I look at them, I, I can see the I can see exactly where their eyes are, right? So, I have a lot of information I can use. I have the um, um, the information of how my head is oriented, which our bodies are keeping track of, the eyes are oriented, where the image appears on the retina, usually it is appearing on the fovea if I am looking at something. So, I have all of this information, I know where the light is coming from, the particular stimulus that I observe, right? If I am reading the clock on the wall, I know exactly where that is at relative to me in terms of angles. I might not know the distance, but we had depth perception, right? And we talked about that. So, if I know the scale of something, maybe based on the size of the image on the retina, I can estimate the distance. You could also do psychophysics studies to figure out how good you are at estimating the distance based on the size on your retina, right? So, we can do these kinds of things. How do we know where sound is coming from using only our ears, right? If you close your eyes, can you determine the source of audio, right? So, every morning when I wake up, I hear the loud Asian coal, right? The, uh, outside and on, on the campus here, very loud bird. I, I feel like I can narrow down where that bird is to within a degree or two. Um, do you feel like that? Can you tell where, can you usually find the bird in the tree, right? How are we able to do that? The auditory So, auditory localization is a very important part of perception. If we are going to make a virtual reality system that produces virtual sounds and if in the real world we have the ability to localize to figure out where sounds are coming from, we better not mess that up, right? We better not fail when we do it in virtual reality. So, how do we how do we get these things? So, that is why understanding is going to be very important. So, where is is sound coming from? Um, we can generally think of uh, three coordinates for that. Let me um, draw the kind of coordinate system here. <coughs> Suppose this is the location of the ear for example and we have some distance d that the source will be from this from the origin and then project down into the plane here we will have um, an angle theta and an angle with respect to the plane um, coming upward which I will call phi. So, that leaves three components. So, we have uh, let us say one, two and three <coughs> the horizontal plane direction which is called azimuth which I have represented there as uh, theta All right. So, we have the horizontal plane. So, just some direction 0 to 2 pi, where is the sound coming from? This seems related to yaw in the um in the coordinate systems we have been talking about for head transformations. Um we have vertical All right. So, how high or low is the sound? Um this will be called elevation I represented that with phi and then we have distance which we have represented with d All right. So, just using spherical coordinates does not matter right All right. <coughs> this just ends up being convenient for the way the ears are arranged and the type of information that um, we get and are able to infer that that um, allow us to resolve where do sounds come from. I am going to give um, an example of a just noticeable difference with regard to audio localization. It is called the minimum audible angle or MAA, which is an example of 
of just noticeable difference. This would be exactly as I said, trying to localize um, where is the bird sound coming from. <clears throat> and so, in terms of the azimuth, so we have the, we have the head and let's suppose it's um, I guess I'll draw kind of a nose here. So, we're looking top down and I want to understand what's the smallest angular change here d delta theta that can be detected. As so you make a very small change you ask people to, to tell whether or not it's in fact moved. Um, so, one thing that's interesting is when it's closer to the front we're much better at it. When it gets to the sides we're not as good at it All right. So, that's one thing to pay attention to. So, when we get up to um, looking straight ahead. So, it's around 1 degree if the stimulus is below a thousand hertz and straight ahead. It's around 5 degrees to the side. There's some exact plots in the book that, co that contain much more information, but I just want to give you the general idea to point out that just based on the geometry of the ears and the way the sense is developed, um, there's no simple answer. It's not always one degree. So, it depends on the frequency, it depends on where the location is. So, once you go over to the side, um, it goes from one degree up to about 5 degrees and it still varies depending on how far over you get to the side. Um, turns out that we are terrible um, perhaps completely unable to localize the direction of sound around 1500 to 1800 hertz on the side All right. So, if we have sources on the side we have a very difficult time localizing them in that frequency range. So, so there is no simple answer right you have to take into account the frequency and where the direction is at um, relative to your head and then you can answer questions about um, the, the minimum audible angle. So, <coughs> how much can you change the direction of the sound source and still be able to tell that. So, I find that interesting. So, if you were going to try to reproduce that in virtual reality and wanted to do some experiments you could have people put on a virtual reality headset, close their eyes, listen to where the sound is coming from and see if you can match that from the real world. Maybe I record the Asian coal making its sounds and then I try to somehow reproduce that in a speaker system and see if I can get humans to respond and give minimum audible angles in the same way right. That is how you would know if you have done it right. Knowing that you have done it right in audio seems significantly more challenging than with video right. In the visual case you look at the images and you say oh I see pixels or all oh, the colors do not look right right. It is very easy for us to just give simple feedback and make some kind of heuristics or hacks that seem to work well enough. Here it may be quite complicated things might sound ok right it may sound all right, but you might not be completely sure unless you have done systematic experiments to make sure that you have reproduced the sound in a way that is as close to possible as in the physical world. Um, <coughs> Now, remember in the case of visual we had um we had depth cues for example right. So, for depth cues we had um monocular depth cues and binocular depth cues correct and and I sort of I, I said that um we tend to emphasize binocular depth cues and I really had to emphasize to you the monocular depth cues. So, the same thing is going to happen here we have monaural cues for localization and we have binaural cues. So, let me go over some um, monaural cues. One, we get a significant amount of information from the pinna that is the shape or geometry of this outer part of our ears and the external ear canal shape. 
So basically the funneling part provides a significant amount of information about where sound is coming from. So a kind of um, signal processing filter or transform is, is, is performed by our outer ear. I will get into more details of that shortly, but I just want to point out that that is a significant amount of information that lets us determine where sound is coming from. It is distorted in different ways across the speak frequency spectrum depending on where the sound is coming from just on how it the sound waves propagate through your pinna and external ear canal. Uh, two, the intensity decreases by the inverse square law. We talked about that in tracking systems for light. So, same thing for um, audio. This may be equivalent to a monocular depth cue that has to do with the retinal image size, right? So, if you know how loud something should be, again, maybe it is the Asian coal and you know how loud that bird typically is. If I can barely hear it, it is probably far away, right? I do not need two ears to determine that, I just need one ear to determine that. If it is a very unusual sound that you have never heard before, maybe this cue will not be so good because you are not sure how loud it is supposed to be anyway. Right? Um, three, the spectrum the spectrum of sounds. So, it turns out that um, when you look at the frequency spectrum of sounds, lower frequency components tend to travel further through air. So, if you hear um, thunder in a lightning storm, I think we had one last night, um, the thunder when it is very far away just sounds like a low frequency rumble. When it is very close you hear the high frequency components. So, that is a distortion in the frequency spectrum that gives you a, a cue as to how far away it is. Right. So, low frequency travels further or there is less dissipation let us say for low frequency as there would be for high frequency. So, that is a kind of distortion it is as if there is a kind of filter applied to it. And <coughs> finally, there is direct versus reverberation energy. Right, so, in the case of reflecting waves, right. reverberation energy. So, um, so, as I speak in this room, my voice is bouncing off of the walls, tables, off of you. Um, there is reverberation energy. So, that is causing phase shifts in these waves. So, you are hearing multiple versions of me at different times. Do I seem to be echoing to you in the room very strongly? Not really, not too much, right? You can hear echo in many cases, right? But I don't think it doesn't seem like unless we were in some enormous church hall, for example, you may hear some echoes because it's a large amount of distance that the sound waves have to travel before coming back. You may perceive this kind of temporal displacement. So you may hear second, third uh, echoes coming back as I talk. Um, this leads me to to give you an, an interesting example. So remember that we had um, optical illusions, right? For the case of the visual sense. Shouldn't there be audio illusions as well? Right? Have you ever heard of any audio illusions? Let me give you a simple audio illusion that's related to reverberation. It helps you to understand this cue. So let's put up some uh, stereo speaker system. So I have a speaker here, and I have a speaker here. <coughs> They're supposed to look like the same size. And um, let us say we put our head here in the middle, right? So we are listening to sounds from the speakers. We do this all the time, right? So I get some kind of stereo sound. Let us suppose I just transmit the same sound to both speakers, just uh, do not worry about stereo separation. You are listening to some kind of music, it is really mono music separated, and, and I am just putting the same audio track out to both channels. So, I have a left and a right track, I guess maybe that is the left track and that is the right track. So, everything seems fine. Now, what I want to do is move my head over here 
right? And I ask you, um, do you hear the speaker at all? If I go over here, it should be the case that I hear the sound from this speaker and then this one comes in significantly later and there should be a time shift, right? Because this one's traveling further away. But I don't hear that, do I? I just hear the sound from this one speaker. I don't hear them both. Try it sometime. Range two speakers, walk back and forth. Usually you hear the sound. You've done this before. Some of you have done this before, I think, right? Am I just making this up? Have you tried this before? You ever notice this? You get really close to one speaker, you hear only that. You get out into the perfect place and you hear both of them. You're like, wow, this is perfect. This is where I'm supposed to be. Then you get over to the other speaker and you only hear that one. Of course, your ears are taking in the sound from both, but your brain is masking away the reverberation from the other one because it's a secondary effect. It's essentially, a, it's perceived as the same audio, but it's time shifted um, and it's lower amplitude, so it just gets masked away. It's an audio or auditory illusion. You don't hear the, the extra echo from that or the time shifted version of that that's falling onto your ears. If I were to suddenly, while I'm over here, turn off the speaker, of course I would hear that one. Right? But you don't perceive it at all when you turn this one on. So auditory illusions. <clears throat> right, questions so far? I want to talk about binaural cues now. Right? So just like we have stereo with our eyes, we should have some kind of stereo with our ears. Um, another interesting part if we want to compare to eyes is um, we had a vestibulo ocular reflex, don't we? Shouldn't we have something like a vestibulo aural reflex or not? Why don't we have that? This, some animals can rotate their ears, right? And so um, I think uh, horses can do that, for example, cats can do that. So if you could orient your ears, then you should be able to also have your vestibular signal connected to that from your vestibular sense so that you could orient your ears to keep them pointed at some audio source, right? We don't have that, but we, we can't even reorient our ears. But some animals can do that. So I'm just pointing out some of the interesting differences. I think it's nice to compare these and, and, and understand the differences. So we don't have a vestibulo aural reflex. <laughs> <coughs> could have happened, but did not seem so important for our survival, I suppose. All right. So let's go to binaural cues. <coughs> so there's two concepts here. One is called ILD, which is uh, inter interaural level interaural level differences. One thing that becomes very important is what's called the acoustic shadow of the ear. Right, so if I'm facing this way and if one of you were to speak um, it's much louder for this ear than the ear that's in the acoustic shadow, right? So just as if it were light, the sound waves as well, due to some diffraction, I may get some bending around the corner due to reverberation off the board, I'll hear more. But generally speaking, the sound should be louder for this ear than for this ear. So that's interaural level difference. So that is one very important binaural cue. These are just like the back faces when we talked about rendering, right? And the other one is ITD, which is interaural time differences. <clears throat> so this is based on different arrival times. in the ears. Um, just for reference, the distance between the ears is about 14 centimeters, depends on your head size of course. But um, so there's that amount of distance maximum and you think about a sound source, right, maybe coming from 45 degrees away from center and it hits this ear first and then this ear. Right, so based on that time difference, believe it or not, 
our, our brains, our neural structure is resolving that temporal difference and it's using, it's measuring that temporal difference or the phase shift between these waves that are coming in and it's um, using that information to determine where the sound is coming from. What I find really interesting about that is that the same thing has been done in engineering for a long time. So, if you've studied sensing systems in engineering, this is called, um, so in engineered sensing systems, this is called multi lateration using what is called time difference of arrival or TDOA. So, if you want to read about the engineering of these systems, um, you can go ahead and, and, and explore it this way. Just look up multilateration and time difference of arrival. So, if I have some um, transmitter and it is transmitting sound and there are um, receivers out in a field somewhere, you can figure out where the transmitted sound is coming from. Interestingly enough, this was even used in World War II, it is called the um, DECA system for um, submarine localization from World War II. So, you can look that up if you like as well. Um, let me say something about the geometry of that and then we can take a break. So, I have receivers let us say um, in two locations maybe here and here. So, they have some distance between them as I said it is about 14 centimeters for human ears. Maybe make that a little bit better. They should look like they're like I'm kind of through the center here. So about here. Oop. All right. Oh. <clears throat> and now there's a sound source somewhere in the space, and then we want to look at. We have this distance, and we have this distance should be straight lines. No, that looks particularly bad, but I don't know. Yeah. All right, so straight lines there. And um, so we have distance to the left and distance to the right. And now <coughs> um, based on the difference in time of arrivals here, right, there's some delta t that I get, right, some difference in time that should be equal to the um, dl minus dr divided by s which is the speed um, in the medium speed of of sound in this particular case right to say speed of sound. So, if I make some calculation like this I now need to think about um, what is the set of all places right if I work backwards. So, I started with the sound source and I said ok we need to look at the um, the difference between these two distances and that will give us a difference in time based on the propagation speed of the waves. So, now let us work backwards. Suppose I have two ears they hear a sound source and a, a difference in time has been detected. What is the set of possible places where the sound could be coming from? And if you work through the algebra for that, it turns out to be a hyperboloid um, and generally you may remember from basic um, conic sections and um, um, analytic geometry hyperboloids come in two sheets the two sheets will be you will get one sheet if one signal came first and you will get the other sheet if the other signal came first. So, it depends on the actual order as far as which sheet you get and I am drawing it in 2 D, but you actually get a hyperboloid it should be peaking right on the axis here and um, the hyperboloid is referred to by perceptual psychologists by the great name uh, the cone of confusion. So, this is the cone of confusion. So, there is a cone shaped region hyperbolic cone 
over which you cannot localize any further using only interaural time differences. <coughs> now, one thing I find fascinating about that is that we can in fact determine where sound is coming from inside of the cone of confusion. Now, part of that is because we are using interaural level differences, but part of it um is because of some more information that is coming later, but um to give you just a hint of it, it has to do with the pinna. So, we can do more information, but if you are only looking at interaural time differences, you have a cone of confusion a region within which you cannot distinguish any further where the sound is coming from based only on this time difference of arrival of the sound waves. Questions about that? <coughs>